Well, Greg Scott is human mating strategies by Professor David Buss in the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. I'll give you the briefest background about Professor Buss. He came to the University of Texas for his bachelor's degree. Then he went on and got his PhD in psychology at the University of California at Berkeley. He then went off to Harvard to become a professor there. Uh, the University of Michigan hired him away from Harvard University. He was a professor at the University of Michigan. And then finally he realized he had to come back to a good school. And the University <laughs> of Texas hired him away from the University of Michigan and uh, then lost our game. Um, I'll let Dr. Buss give you a little bit about his background when he begins, but it just was interesting to work with a lot of our speakers, find out who they are as people, as scientists, etc., as researchers, as teachers, and I'd like to share one interesting fact about Dr. Buss is that he drives an 1980 Yamaha E50 Special. <laughs> so, please welcome Professor David Buss. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, am I uh, heard at the back? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for all showing up here. And I was asked to say just a few words about how I got into science or what excited me about science or why I find science exciting. And the first, and there are basically two, the short version is that there are two things that really excited me about science. The first was when I was an undergraduate at UT taking a geology class and I came upon the theory of evolution proper in that geology class and it blew my mind. It amazed me that there were actually theories that existed to explain the origins of things. In this case the origins and evolution of life but also things like uh, there's evolution in cosmology. Okay, theories of the origin, origin and evolution of the universe. So theories of the origins of things, those are the ideas that first got me excited about science, with evolutionary theory being the, the, the one in particular that excited me. And the second thing is that I was deeply curious about human nature. I was interested in what motivated people, what caused people to get up out of bed in the morning rather than just stay in bed, what made people tick. What is the design of the human mind? Uh, and so con bringing these two ideas together, evolutionary theory for understanding human nature, uh, led to ultimately to my research program on mating and I also study murder for those who are interested in that. So mating and murder. I thought when I, when I started studying murder that this would get me away from the topic of mating, but it turns out that mating is very closely related to murder. If you, if you ask what are the key motives for murder, most of them boil down to mating in one form or another. So, uh, so that's a little bit about uh, how I got into this. Um, this is the title of one of my books, and I'm going to be focusing on uh, the theoretical framework that I use to study human mating strategies and then kind of toggle back and forth between some theoretical ideas and empirical research that I and my colleagues have conducted that illuminate various aspects of human mating. Human mating is a very complicated topic and there's been a lot written about it. I've written several books myself and there's a, there are literally thousands of articles now published in the scientific literature, more coming out literally every day. Uh, and so it's a rapidly growing field. So I hope this talk gives some of you the curiosity to explore, if not human mating strategies, but science and the science of human nature. So without further throat clearing, let me proceed. Uh, first thing I want to do is note that mating strategies uh, are very context specific. And even though I, I'm going to be talking about an evolutionary framework, that doesn't mean that when people think about evolution, they think of stereotypic robotic-like instincts with no input from the environment. But mating strategies, in fact, are highly contingent on different contexts, such as different species. So different species have different mating strategies. If you look at even our closest primate relative, the chimpanzee, they have a very different mating strategy than we do, even though we share some more than 98% of our DNA with chimps. In the chimpanzee mating system, basically 
females experience a, a phase called the estrus phase, where the females emit uh, bright red genital swellings, olfactory cues. The male chimps go into a kind of a sexual frenzy when this occurs and try to mate with the female during that period with the alpha male getting the majority of the matings, but the betas and the gamma still trying to get in the mix. And then when the estrus phase is over, uh, the males are basically indifferent to females and don't pay any attention to them, don't interact with them all that much. Human mating is very, very different. As far as I know, I have never observed, in, at least in the UT campus, well, I won't even go there. Um, <laughs> but you get the point. We have a very different mating system. Different cultures as well. Uh, culture has a profound impact on our mating system. I'm going to give some empirical evidence for that. Different ecologies. Also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the prevalence of parasites and how those affect mating strategies. Unique experiences or experiences that occur during development, during your lifetime, such as father absence versus having a father present who's highly investing. It turns out that father absent versus father present influences whether you pursue a short-term or long-term mating strategy. Father absent, growing up a father absent home, you're more likely to pursue a short-term mating strategy. Uh, sex uh, surplus of one gender, this is basically called in the field uh, sex ratio imbalance. If there's a surplus of women as opposed to a surplus of men, that influences mating strategies. Um, uh, different genders, of course, I'm going to talk about that more. And your own mate value, uh, as the theoretician Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones noted, uh, you can't always get what you want. Um, <laughs> but if you try sometimes, well, your, your mate value influences your ability to enact your preferred mating strategy. Now, one of the reasons that I call my, my first book on mating, The Evolution of Desire, is because I believe that desire lies at the foundation of our whole mating system. We have to understand what men and women desire in potential mates in order to understand the large panoply of strategies of human mating. So if you understand what someone desires in the opposite sex, then you have basically a key or a recipe for successful tactics for attracting that individual. Okay? So different aspects of mating Successful mate retention tactics, what we call mate guarding or mate retention, involve fulfillment of desire, conflict between the sexes, causes of divorce, violation of desire, the ways in which we compete, for example, using verbal signals, otherwise known as gossip, slander, the ways we derogate or denigrate our competitors to make them less desirable to members of the opposite sex. Those all involve impugning your rivals on qualities that are desired by the people that they're trying to attract. And so understanding all the different strategies of human mating require understanding what we desire in a mate. And moreover, we have to make the distinction between desiring in a mate in what context. Because as we're going to see, it matters a great deal whether you're pursuing a long-term committed mate versus a one-night stand or even a... Um, temporary affair partner. Now, I want to say a few words about the theory of evolution by selection. Um, evolution by selection, as I mentioned, when people talk about it or they think about it in lay terms, they think about these rigid robotic instincts, but they also think about one other thing. They think about survival. They use phrases like survival of the fittest, nature red in tooth and claw, individuals, the imagery that's evoked is individuals struggling for mere survival, competing with each other for mere survival. And of course, that's part of what Darwin meant. And in fact, he originally called his theory of natural selection the theory of survival selection, dealt with the evolution of characteristics because of the survival advantage that individuals accrue. But there were phenomena that could not be explained by this so-called survival selection phenomena that troubled Darwin deeply. For example, he noted things like, oh, I guess I have technology here, I can use this. He noted things like the brilliant plumage of peacocks. And he asked the question, how could this weird metabolically expensive structure possibly have evolved? Why, how could it possibly contribute to survival? 
Not only is it metabolically expensive, it's like a, a neon sign to predators advertising fast food. It's bad for survival. How could this evolve? Darwin even noted, he said, the sight of a peacock gives me nightmares. Uh, he could not explain this with his theory of survival selection. Uh, he noted other things, uh, sexual dimorphism, differences in the size, shape, morphology of males and females of the same species. And the reason that this puzzled him, so on the top here, these are homodryas baboons, and in homodryas baboons you can tell which one is the male. Can you all tell which one the male is? Right, the big one, right. And in the homodryas baboons, the males are about twice the size of females. The red fur seals at the bottom uh, the sexual dimorphism is even larger. So males are about five or six times the weight of uh, females. So the females on average are about 110 pounds. The males on average are about 600 pounds. So you get extreme sexual dimorphism. The reason that this puzzled Darwin was because both sexes face the same survival problems or similar survival problems. Both sexes have to eat, both sexes have to thermoregulate if they're warm-blooded organisms, both sexes have to fend off parasites, they have to fend off predators. Basically, they have to deal with all of what he called eloquently the hostile forces of nature that impede survival. So if they faced these same survival problems, why would they differ in size or morphology? And moreover, why would different species differ in the magnitude of sexual dimorphism? Why would, you, why would you find some species like these red fur seals that show enormous sexual dimorphism, others such as homodryas baboons that show moderate sexual dimorphism, others such as humans that show even less, males are about 8 to 12 percent taller than females, although other metrics of sexual dimorphism show greater um, greater sex differences, such as upper body strength and distribution of fat uh, differ between the sexes. So it depends on which index of sexual dimorphism you use. So, so how could we explain these things? Darwin was very puzzled by this, but eventually he came up with what he believed was a second evolutionary theory that could explain things like the brilliant plumage of peacocks and sexual dimorphism. And that is the theory of sexual selection. The theory of sexual selection deals not with the evolution of characteristics by virtue of the survival advantage that they give organisms, but rather because by virtue of the mating advantage they give organisms. And mating advantage basically boils down to two component processes which are very simple to describe, but they're very powerful theoretically and very, very important in understanding human mating strategies. Same-sex competition and intersexual selection. Inter means between sexual, the sexes, between the sexes selection, which means preferential mate choice. So uh, this is a stereotypic example of intersexual competition. Two stags locking horns in combat. The victor uh, gains sexual access to the female. Loser ambles off with a broken antler. Dejected, suffering from low self-esteem needing my psychology psychotherapist to, to aid his boost in self-esteem and hence mate value so that he can enter the fray again. I'm joking on that, <laughs> only partially. Uh, the logic is very simple. Whatever qualities lead to success in these same-sex battles, those qualities increase in frequency over generations by virtue of the sexual access that the victors gain. Qualities associated with loss basically bite the evolutionary dust because the losers fail to gain mating access and they fail to reproduce. And so you have evolution, which simply means change over time. In this case, change over time as a result of some qualities being associated with victory and some being associated with loss in these same-sex contests. Now, the way that I've described it, this is what biologists call contest competition, where you have a literal physical battle. And, but uh, the logic is more general than that. So in our species, for example, and I I've note there are some UT students here, I've, I've never walked across the UT campus and seen two males fighting 
ringed by a group of females who are waiting to see who the victor is going to be and then mating with the guy who wins. Um, now, it may occur, uh, but I haven't witnessed it. But, but we do other things, though. We compete for sometimes physical uh, supremacy, but we, we also compete for position and status hierarchies. We're an extremely hierarchical species. Uh, and position and status hierarchies gives you greater mating access. And so we can compete in the ways that are different from merely physical contest competition. So the key point is that the logic of intrasexual competition, this process is more general than just contest competition. The second causal process is preferential mate choice. So what we're looking for, what's looking for us, okay, <laughs> what are the qualities that are desired? And the logic is, is, is this. If members of one sex agree with one another, if there's some consensus about the qualities desired in the opposite sex, and those qualities have a partial heritable ba basis, then those who possess the desired qualities have a mating advantage. They get preferentially chosen, selected. Those who lack the desired qualities get shunned. They get banished. They remain single. Uh, uh, and so again, what you see is evolution that is change over time due, in, due to an increase in frequency of the desired qualities. Now, just to, to give this a, a concrete example, uh, hypothetically, if it were the case that women preferred to mate with men who had red hair, and this process iterated generation after generation, then this entire room would be ablaze with redheads simply due to this pref mate preference. Now, looking around the room, I see a few redheads, but clearly this hasn't been the dominant preference. Okay, otherwise, we would see more redheads here. But you see the point. Whatever qualities are desired. Now, as I said, this is all old hat in a way. This is Darwin. Okay, so Darwin, uh, Origin of Species, 1859. Darwin, Sexual Selection Theory, 1872. But... It was, the theory of sexual selection was extremely controversial in Darwin's time. People, especially the preferential mate choice component of it, Darwin called this preferential mate choice component, he called it female choice. And he called it female choice because he observed that in many species, females seem to be more discriminating, more intelligent, more discerning about the qualities of the mates they selected, whereas males basically lacked standards. Um, uh, and the reason that this was controversial is that the predominantly male, almost exclusively male biologists at the time thought this was preposterous that something as, as they thought whimsical as female choice could actually influence the evolution of characteristics of species. And so the theory of sexual selection fell into great disrepute in Darwin's time. We said, Charles, we can go along with you on the natural selection, but the sexual selection stuff's a little dicey. And so it wasn't really until there, were, there was a brief flurry in the 1930s with R.A. Fisher, but it really wasn't until 1972 that sexual selection theory really started to take off, more, about 100 years after, uh, after Darwin. And it was due to a graduate student at Harvard named Robert Trivers. Uh, but now sexual selection theory we know is extremely important and is the dominant framework for understanding the mating patterns, mating strategies of uh, many different species. Okay, now I want to focus on humans. We have a very complex uh, array of mating strategies. We don't have just one mating strategy. Things would be very simple if we just had one mating strategy. But we don't. We have a complex menu. We have long-term committed mating. And you may think, okay, well, that's obvious. Of course we have long-term committed mating. We get married, you know. But it turns out that long-term committed mating is a very, very unusual mating strategy it occurs in something like 3% of all mammal species. So there are about 4,000 mammal species on the face of the earth, although some are going extinct. Um, hopefully we won't, uh, but, uh, but only about 3%. So it's a kind of unusual, even though we take it for granted, it's an unusual mating strategy. But we also, and I know this will shock you, we also have short-term opportunistic mating. 
Uh, we have other things like cheating, so engage in the long-term committed mating and, and what avian biologists call EPCs. You can memorize that, EPCs, extra pair copulations. And then don't try to use this though if you're trying to attract a mate. So don't say, walk up and say, hello, would you like to EPC with me? <laughs> um, bad. Um, a cereal mating, so and this doesn't refer to Cheerios uh, uh, or Wheaties. This refers to mating with one person followed by a breakup and then maybe a flurry of short-term mating and then another bout of long-term mating. And then we, of course, like to mix and match. Uh, so we have a complex menu of mating strategies. Now, what I want to focus on, and in the rest of the talk, focus on some empirical data on different aspects of these two components of mating strategies. That is, well, what do we want in a mate? What are the qualities that men and women desire? And what are the strategies? What are some of the mating strategies that we employ in trying to attract mates, retain mates, poach other people's mates, uh, et cetera? So the first uh, thing, the first study I want to point out is a study that I did of 37 different cultures involving more than 10,000 subjects. And we basically had uh, a wide variety of cultures. We didn't have every culture. And I knew when I did this study, someone would come up to me and say, but Dr. Buss, did you study the bongo bongos in northern South Swahili? And I didn't. Actually, that's a fictitious group. There is no group called the bongo bongos in northern South Swahili. But we had a pretty wide array of things. I had, of course, couldn't do this alone. I had um, uh, 50 different research collaborators who were native residents of each of these cultures. And they, uh, together as a research team, we did this study. The only uh, sample that I insisted on collecting personally was the Hawaiian sample. Um, which I've recently discovered uh, was perhaps problematic, and so I have to go back there again very soon <laughs> to retest this uh, sample. Uh, so what did we find? Well, we found some things that were universally desired. We found some things that were highly variable across cultures in their desire, and we found some things that were sex differentiated pretty much universally in their desire. Let me give you examples of these. So universal desires, and, and this was kind of heartwarming to me, is that love turned out to be close to the top or at the top of what people wanted in a long-term mate. They wanted someone that they were in love with and that was in, who, someone that was in love with them. And we wanted things like good health, kindness, intelligence, sociable, easygoing, etc. No one wanted a, a mean, stupid, disease-ridden mate. Per, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps not terribly surprising. Uh, but still heartwarming. Um, we found some things that were highly variable across cultures in the magnitude of their desires. So in this, we had a couple of different research instruments. One was a rating instrument where we looked at, uh, this isn't centered properly, but basically we looked at virginity. How important is virginity? And so on a zero is irrelevant, three it's indispensable. And as you can see in mainland China, this is mainland China, not Taiwan, uh, both sexes said it's indispensable. Don't want to mate with someone who is not a virgin. And then we, and then we go down, we start to see some sex differences, Palestinian, Arabs, I'm not, I'm not going to present data from all 37, but these are just illustrative. All the way to the Swedes, who not only placed no value on it, <laughs> some said it was bad, undesirable. <laughs> Why didn't you give me negative numbers so I could tell you I really don't like this quality? So, uh, so, so their culture does have an impact on some mate preferences. And uh, uh, what we found is that it had an impact in two ways. One is in the absolute value placed on, in this case, virginity, but also culture influenced the presence or absence of sex differences. So in the study of 37 cultures, we found basically uh, about 62% of the culture showed a sex difference in the importance placed on chastity that of this sort, where men valued it more than women. But we also found 38% of the cultures where there was no sex difference, basically, such as Sweden or China. Uh, and, so, and so cultural input seems to be extremely important in this variable. And we've gone back to, uh, just published a recent study of mainland China, and the value placed on chastity is gradually going down in mainland China. Uh, so, so cultures affect things not just across cultures, but over time. And a similar trend we found within the United States. We've looked at mate preferences going back 
uh, about uh, 80 or 90 years or so. I have, not me personally, I'm not that old. Uh, but uh, mate preferences for chastity have gradually gone down within the United States. We also find some regional differences as well. Can you guess which region I had? Here we had four regions in the United States. We had Cambridge, Massachusetts, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Berkeley, California, Austin, Texas. <laughs> which one do you think placed the most value on chastity? Austin, Texas. How about the least value? Berkeley. So <laughs> some of you may say, okay, why am I at UT then? Uh, okay. Now, uh, I want to shift to sex differences. So I talked a little bit about universal preferences, a little bit about cultural variation, but we found some things that were um, universally sex differentiated in their value. And I wanted to present what we call a meta theory, which is just a theory of theories. Uh, what, what is the evolutionary logic for expecting sex differences or sexual similarities? The logic is that we expect the sexes to be similar in all those domains where they face similar adaptive problems, such as eating, predator avoidance, parasite avoidance, or, or immune system, immune function, and so forth. It's only in those domains where the sexes have faced different adaptive problems recurrently over evolutionary time that we expect to see sex differences. Now, what are those domains? Well, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so what are the recurrently different adaptive problems faced by the sex? Well, I want to first just very briefly give you a cartoonist rendition of what the differences are between male and female brains. Uh, oh, I guess we took those. Did we take those out? I guess we took those out. Well, uh, okay, well, here, here are the differences. Okay, fertilization occurs internally within females, not within males. And you may think, well, of course, that's obvious, but it's a very important phenomenon and doesn't occur in all species. There are some species where fertilization occurs external to both sexes. So certain fish species where the female deposits her eggs and the male swims along and then deposits his sperm on top of those eggs and then they both swim off and go to the singles bar or, or in the case of salmon, they just die. <laughs> Nothing left to do after that. Uh, and there are even some species in which there is internal male fertilization where the female takes her egg and implants it within the male body. But in our species, humans, and in all 257 species of primates, and in all 4,000 species of mammals, fertilization happens to occur internally within females. And that's very important because that creates a sex differentiated adaptive problem or a couple one of which is known as the problem of paternity uncertainty. Men can never be sure. Some cultures use the phrase, mama's baby, papa's maybe, <laughs> to capture this asymmetry. As far as I know, no woman has ever given birth and as the child is emerging from her body, wonders, uh, gee, is this, is this kid really my own? <laughs> Uh, if you ever saw Rosemary's baby, you know, she, the kid might have looked a little weird, red eyes and everything, but, uh, but there was still maternity certainty. But men can never be sure because of that internal female fertilization. Uh, there's also, um, well, the, on the fourth line, that also results in the potential for misdirected parental investment. So a man could invest in offspring in the mistaken belief that those children are his own when in fact they are the children of the next door neighbor or the guy across the street. Uh, and that would be very costly in ed the evolutionary currency of reproductive success. Uh, and so another sex difference is this one here, parental investment. I'll ask you this question, a thought question. What is the minimum investment a woman has to put in to produce one child? Yes, exactly, nine months. And it's, it's obligatory, right? Women, do, it's part of our reproductive biology. Women don't have a choice. They can't say, look, I'm very busy with my career. I would prefer to invest only two and a half months. <laughs> it's just, it's part of our reproductive biology. Now, what is the minimum investment men have to put in to produce that same child? <laughs> I, got, I heard a five minutes and then I heard a, a 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, well, it's important to note that there are individual differences. Uh, 
but even if it's uh, 30 minutes or, or 30 days, it's still you can see there's a substantial sex difference in the minimum obligatory investment. Now, fortunately, some men some of the time invest more than the minimum um, in our species. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see this is a fundamental aspect of human reproductive biology that creates different adaptive problems for men and women. Um, uh, breastfeeding, of course, is something that women do that men don't. Women have concealed ovulation, which is very, very interesting. In contrast to our closest primate relative, the chimpanzee, our ovulation is concealed or cryptic or relatively concealed or cryptic. There's some evidence that there are some subtle changes that are potentially physically, that are potentially observable at ovulation. So uh, in terms of, uh, even in terms of uh, facial appearance, vocal qualities and other things, but these are relatively subtle. So you can't just walk, uh, walk across the UT camps and say, oh yeah, she's ovulating. <laughs> she's, she's not ovulating. No, these are very, very subtle signals and not at all like the uh, chimpanzee. And then of course, ovulation is also uh, cyclic in our species, which is very important. Now, so what is the empirical evidence that these sex differences, and I've described some of the most important ones of our reproductive biology, what is the empirical evidence that these have produced psychological, behavioral, and strategic differences in our mating strategies? I want to give you a cartoonist rendition, I guess we switch the order of that, a cartoonist rendition of what these sex differences are. This is a cartoonist rendition of the male brain um, with the, uh, the, the listening particle right there. Hopefully the males in this room have a, a, a larger listening particle. Uh, and this is the, the analog of the female brain. Uh, well, <clears throat> okay, so what do men and women really want? <clears throat> Uh, I can sell these cartoons after my talk. No, they're, uh, they're re available easily online. So, uh, okay, so uh, what do we want? Okay, now I wanna do a thought experiment now. Okay, let's pretend that I am the king of the universe and I will grant you your magic wish. Okay, I have that power. What I want you to do is tell me how m ideally, in your ideal world, how many sex partners would you like to have over the next 10 years? You just think about it for a second, tell me the number, and I will grant you that number of sex partners. How many sex partners would you like to have? Any brave souls? <laughs> well, we don't have to, we don't have, you don't have to volunteer because we know. Um, <laughs> this is number of partners, this is different time intervals. How many do you want over the next month, six years, your lifetime? Women said on average they would like eight-tenths of a sex partner over the next month. <laughs> gradually escalating to a full sex partner at six months, leveling off at four to five in lifespan. Men said two in the next month would be about right, eight in the next couple of years, and 18 in the lifespan. This is after eliminating three men from our study who said they were like a thousand. Um, um, let's say you met someone of the opposite sex who you found attractive. What is the likelihood that you would have sex with them uh, after different time intervals have elapsed, ranging from five years to one hour. So this is, yes, you'd for sure have sex, or no, absolutely not. If this person were the last person on Earth, I wouldn't. And in this, in this experiment, we found that if you've known the person for five years, you find them attractive, both sexes agree, high probability of sex happening. But as you can see, the sexes start to diverge with time intervals shorter, with women getting very skeptical, at one week, men still not skeptical at one week. And, 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 and in fact, we stopped at one hour, but uh, my, uh, my former student and now colleague, David Schmidt, has replicated this in 50 different cultures. And we've gone out to a, uh, a second, uh, a minute, a second, and a nanosecond to see <laughs> what happens. And, and to my dismay, men just basically flatline here. They, they, they never get very skeptical about the idea of, uh, of having sex. Um, now there's a Florida study. Uh, and the, the, at UT and, and at UT Austin, we have things called ethical review boards, called IRBs, uh, institutional review boards, where we have to get approval for the studies that we do. Apparently in Florida, they don't have these things. Uh, and what they did is so they did a study that I would have liked to do, but I didn't, but my colleagues did, where they basically had men and women who were confederates, and now this doesn't refer to people from the South, 
This is psychology speak for members of the experimental team. They had them simply, the, these confederates, walk up to members of the opposite sex on a college campus and say, hi, I've been, at, I've been noticing you around campus. I find you very attractive. And they asked them one of three questions. Uh, would you go uh, out on a date with me? Would you go back to my apartment with me? Would you have sex with me? <laughs> and the dependent variable was simply they recorded the percentage of individuals who agreed to these three different requests. For those who were interested in research design, it was a between groups design with re people randomly asked one of the three questions. But what did they find? Of the women approached by the male confederates, and this surprised me, 50% agreed to go out on a date with the guy. 6% agreed to go back to his apartment. 0% agreed to have sex with him. And women in the sex condition thought it was a rather peculiar question to be asked. That most women need a little more information about the guy before they have sex with him. Uh, of the men approached by the female confederates, also 50% agreed to go out on a date with her. 69% agreed to go back to her apartment. <laughs> and 75% agreed to have sex with her. So for those who, and of the 25% of the men who declined, several were apologetic about it, citing a girlfriend or parents in town asking, <laughs> asking for a phone number and a rain check. Uh, very, very different responses. Uh, so for those who are skeptical about the idea that men and women differ in their underlying sexual psychology, I'll just draw your attention to these last figures, zero versus 75%. This has been replicated in various ways to eliminate different sorts of confounds. and It's a very uh, replicable effect, but it's a behavioral study. It's using a behavioral measure. Uh, and this is actually, if you're interested, you can go on YouTube and there was someone who decided to do this not as an official study, but a guy and a woman literally went up to pe 100 people, that was their assignment, and asked 100 members of the opposite sex, would you have sex with me? And the guy, his self-esteem kept getting lower and lower and lower <laughs> as he got rejected. Uh, so, now there's another thing, a uh, phenomenon, this is a, uh, called the closing time phenomenon. And this stems actually the chair of the psychology department here, Dr. Jamie Pennebaker, was the first to discover this. And he was listening to a country and western song uh, with, that apparently has this lyric. It says something like, ain't it true, I'm not going to sing it because I have a bad voice, but ain't it true that girls get prettier near closing time? And as a social psychologist, he thought, hmm, I could test that hypothesis. <laughs> as psychologists get their hypothesis from the weirdest sources. Uh, but he found that he went into bars and he simply, you know, said how attractive, you know, different as closing time approach. And he found that indeed there is a closing time effect. Now, of course, when he published this, people said, well, wait a minute. Come on. They're drunk. What about beer goggles? It's a beer goggles phenomenon, not a closing time phenomenon. And so subsequent studies controlled for alcohol consumption. And after you statistically control for a number of alcohol beverages consumed, you, you do get a beer goggles effect, but you also get a closing time effect above and beyond the beer goggles effect. Uh, and it turns out it's a very replicable effect. Now, men, I want to shift to a different thing. Men face what I call the assessment problem. And this has to do with the fact that we have such a different mating system from chimpanzees. So the male chimpanzee, if you're a male chimpanzee, you don't have to sit down and worry, uh, gee, is this female chimp, is she fertile or not? she displays that she's fertile with that estrus phase. Okay, but our ancestral males could never tell. We couldn't tell that it, whether a female was fertile or not. But uh, if you were in a business school, or if you're a business major, in the business world, they would call this job one. You have to select a fertile mate. Those who don't select fertile mates basically are not our ancestors or don't become ancestors. Uh, only those who selected fertile mates became ancestors and produced children. But how do you do this when fertility is not advertised like it is in chimpanzees? And so this is what I call the assessment problem. All that would have been available to our ancestral uh, relatives, the human ancestors, would have been those physical and behavioral cues that were statistically reliably associated with fertility which cannot be observed directly. It's an internal quality that cannot be observed directly. And physical appearance provides, in fact, a wealth of those cues. And so uh, this is the evolutionary theory of the logic of standards of attractiveness. 
So here are some observable things. Full lips, clear skin, clear eyes, lustrous hair, good muscle tone, sprightly gait, symmetrical features, and so forth. These are observable things. For those uh, in the field, this is technically known as a, a Brunswick lens diagram. And so the theory, though, is that our standards of attractiveness evolve to embody those observable cues that are statistically reliably correlated with fertility. So, uh, and so it's a very testable theory, and this is a, simply a way of diagramming the nature of the hypothesis or sub-hypotheses embedded with it in this. So if you can discover a cue that would have been available to ancestral males that was reliably linked with fertility, it should have been it should be part of our evolved standards of attractiveness. Now, of course, this goes radically against mainstream thinking in the social sciences. What I was taught when I was an undergraduate was, as we know, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It's infinitely variable across cultures. People in the bongo bongos, they like people who look very, very different from we do. But it turn, and, and there is some cross-cultural variation. The primary degree of cross-cultural variation or the primary variable that varies across cultures is relative thinness or plumpness. And it turns out that in cultures that value relative plumpness, those tend to be cultures where the local ecology uh, has a food shortage. So food scarcity is correlated with whether we prefer plump or thin figures. Uh, but it turns out that going back to the uh, cross-cultural study that men more than women, and this is a human universal, men place more importance on physical attractiveness in long-term mates. Now, uh, two things are important to note. One is you may say, well, this supports my hypothesis that men are slime. Um, <laughs> but they're slime in a very domain-specific way. Moreover, it's not the case that women are oblivious to physical attractiveness. They value it as well. It's just not as important. And part of the reason it's not as important is that male fertility has a very, very different age distribution than female fertility. Basically, most men are at least somewhat fertile. Fertility does decline uh, with age in the human male, but much more gradually than it does in, uh, than, than female. So physical appearance provides a wealth of information about fertility. And for both sexes, it provides a wealth of information about health status. And women should care about health status, uh, and they do. Uh, and as it turns out, we now know that the, what I was taught when I was an undergraduate is wrong. It's one of what I call one of the great myths in the social sciences, that standards of beauty are infinitely variable across cultures. They're not. Okay, so there are studies now where you take pictures uh, of people in mainland China or Korea and you bring them to Russia or South America and you find that the people, there's tremendous consensus across cultures in what people find attractive. Cues to youth, cues to health are uh, critical in terms of standards of female beauty and they're all linked to fertility. Okay, this is not wanting to advance now. Uh, I mentioned ecology, and we did a study where we wanted to explain not just things like sex differences, but also variability across cultures. And cultures do vary in the importance they attach to physical appearance. And one of the things that we know, and this is, I have to give credit to my colleague Steve, uh, this is not, no longer working, I guess. The battery must be dead on this. Uh, so I don't know if we have another battery, but, oh, thank you. Oh, this is, <laughs> boy. Ask and you shall receive, huh? Um, uh, my colleague Steve Gangaset is really responsible for the, uh, the theory behind this. But basically, parasites, okay, we, as long-lived organisms, we uh, are host to thousands and thousands of parasites. Some parasites are okay, but some parasites are detrimental to us. And if you have a large if a large number of parasites inhabiting your body, it will degrade your physical appearance certain types of parasites more than others. So think, think of something like a ringworm. Okay. So someone, things that produced open sores and lesions or pus, and I won't give you all the gross images. I have a graduate student now who's actually studying these gross images and as they pertain to the topic of sexual disgust. But what we find is that we are able to account for 50% of the cultural variation in the importance attached to physical attractiveness with a composite index of parasite pre prevalence. 
So it's, it's one of the remarkable demonstrations of taking an ecological variable and using it to predict cultural variation. Okay, this is still not working, so I have to do it this way. Uh, age, men value, uh, value relative youth in long-term mates, and this is especially true, this is a human universal, but it's especially true in uh, polygynous cultures such as Zambia. We had four polygynous cultures in our sample of 37. Polygyny is basically where males are legally permitted to uh, marry multiple mates. And uh, in polygynous societies, males are typically older before they're in a resource position to attract a mate. And, uh, and the only exception to this, by the way, is very, very interesting, uh, is with teenage boys. And some of you may be in the audience here. Okay, how many, are there any 15 year olds? Okay, I don't see, no one's raising their hand. Okay, a couple 15 year olds. Okay, so I can pick on you then. Uh, but uh, uh, no, ba no male 15 year olds. Any male 15 year olds? Okay, 15, I can pick on them then. So there are no, none here, I think. Uh, and if there are, forgive me for picking on you. Okay, what we find is, well, what is the ideal age preference of, of pimply-faced 15-year-old boys? They do, not, they do not prefer younger partners. They actually are most attracted to older women, older meaning, say, 17, 18. Now, this is a very interesting finding, this reversal of this pre standard preference for younger mates. Now, it's interesting because it falsifies two alternative hypotheses for these data. You could say, well, well, maybe it's the case that, that you know, reinforcement theory is what accounts for it. Men are reinforced more for valuing younger women, or perhaps they want to value women that they can control. Okay? Now, I will ask you this thought experiment. Okay, think back to when you were in high school. 15-year-old boys attracted to the 17, 18-year-old girls. Were these 17-year-old, 18-year-old girls, were they interested in the 15-year-old boys? How many women, when they were 17 or 18, found 15-year-olds really hot? Like the, I guess it would be like the Justin Bieber type uh, age. Okay, it doesn't happen. These women typically, there's the occasional exception, typically these, these women, these 15-year-old boys don't even exist on their radar screen. They ignore them. Okay, so they are not reinforced by, the, by them, and I can guarantee you these 15-year-old boys can't control these 17- and 18-year-old females. Okay, so, so it's an interesting um, phenomenon where it seems that the age preference is at least to some degree tracking fertility uh, rather than uh, uh, a strict age preference per se. Um, as men get older, they prefer women who are increasingly younger than they are, uh, other cues, a co former colleague of mine who's unfortunately now deceased, Professor Devendra Singh, discovered a very interesting cue to physical attractiveness, waist to hip ratio. Okay, the circumference of your waist relative to that of your hips of about 0 0.70 seems to be most attractive. And it turns out waist to hip ratio is a cue to youth. So waist to hip ratio increases as you get older. It's a cue to health. So if you have certain endocrinological diseases, it increases your waist to hip ratio. And it's also a cue to non-pregnancy, non right? So what happens when a female gets pregnant? What happens to a waist to hip ratio? Waist gets larger and larger and larger relative to her hips. And so those men who found pregnant women to be the most attractive sexually, well, they're at that moment temporarily infertile. And those men left no descendants. Um, okay, now, so, now what do women want? People have been posing this question for a very, very long time. Uh, and, and there's a reason for it. Uh, the reason that, that men have been pulling their hair out about this question is because women's mate preferences turn out to be very complex. I teach a course called, uh, in, in the psych department called uh, Psychology of Human Mating. And in that course, I do a thought experiment where I ask my students to simply tell me, tell me what do women want? And I'll just write it up on the board. And so they say, well, I want a, I want a mate who's, who's intelligent, who's kind, who's understanding, who I can communicate with, 
who, who, who's not, you know, doesn't spend 14 hours on video games. Uh, and they go start listing these things, uh, similar political views, similar religious views, uh, compatible in this way and that way. And they start listing these things. And I start on one side of the board and I list them and I go to the five blackboards worth and then I run out of space. Um, and then I ask men a parallel question. I get about a board and a half and then men run out of <laughs> answers and then so the women help them. I say, Don't you, I think what you really want is this. So, so uh, women seem to have more insight into male mating psychology than men do into their own mating psychology. Okay, now this is, oops, sorry, here. Uh, so now, now the interesting thing is that that men vary in thousands of ways in principle. Uh, you know, we vary in index finger length and speed of toenail growth and in earlobe width, you know. We vary in a million ways. And, and one of the facts about decision theory is that constants don't count. So no woman, as far as I know, said, uh, told her friend excitedly, look, I just met this guy. He is really hot. He has an opposable thumb. <laughs> he walks bipedally. <laughs> he speaks a language. No, constants, constants don't count. It, it's only the differences that, that, that matter. So what should women um, uh, prefer? Well, they face a number of different problems, a lot of challenges. They have to identify the relevant attributes. They have to assess which men possess those attributes. They have to accurately assess their own mate value because if you're you know, a nine or a seven or a five or a three or a one, then the uh, quality of the mate that you're going to be successful in attracting is going to be diff different. So they have to target men in the relevant mate value range and they have to avoid deception. Yes, I know this will shock you, but men sometimes lie. <laughs> and so women have the problem of avoiding deception. And we've done studies where we've looked at deception between the sexes. So this is with my graduate student, former graduate student, now a professor at UCLA, Marty Hazelton. And what we found is that in, in our study of actual experiences, have you ever been deceived by a member of the opposite sex? Women report more than men that they have uh, experienced deception in the form of men exaggerating the depths of their feelings or exaggerating their commitment in order to have sex. Um, and women get very upset about this when they do. So if a man has sex with a woman and the next morning he says, oh, by the way, I, I lied to you last night. I told you I loved you and cared about you, but it, I don't at all. I just wanted to have sex with you. Goodbye. I never want to see you again. Women are very upset about that. Um, more so than men. Uh, preference for economic resources and uh, it turns out this is another cross-cultural universal. Uh, it occurs in all 37 cultures and, and, and it even occurs in cultures such as Sweden and Norway uh, and Finland that have greater economic equality between the sexes. And we've done studies even within cultures and say, well, maybe it's because women don't have the resources. If only women could gain access to the resources themselves, then they wouldn't care. Then they'd be happy to mate with the guy who's flipping burgers at McDonald's. Um, but no, it's not the case. What we find is that rather very successful women, women who are very good professionally and successful at gaining their own economic resources, have even higher standards for the mates they marry in economic research. They don't relax their standards and say, oh yes, McDonald's slippers, that, 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 that guy is really the one for me. Um, uh, preference for social status. Social status is of course correlated with resources. And you know, as I mentioned Mick Jagger earlier, but, but most of us can't get what we want. Okay? Only those who embody the qualities desired by the opposite sex can attract who they want. Now, this couple, uh, one of these couples is still together, uh, one is not. So, uh, so I guess this worked for a while. There was an age gap. Uh, as Catherine Zeta-Jones is 25 years younger than Michael Douglas, but their marriage apparently seems to be on the rocks. Uh, but it lasted 12 years, which by Hollywood standards is pretty good. I think the mean length of marriage is something like two and a half years in Hollywood. 
Um, uh, do men lie? Well, yes, they lie in specific ways. They lie about their status uh, and their resources, and they do this even online. So there have been studies. So those of you who are going on, doing online dating, be wary. Okay, but the men and women both lie. They both deceive, but in very specific ways. So there are studies where they say you ask men how tall they are, what their actual income is, what their weight is, etc. And you ask women the same things, and then they bring them into the lab, and then they get their tax forms, and they find out what they actually make. Um, and what they find is that men, with respect to height, they, they tack on a couple of inches. So if a man is 5'10", they kind of round up and say, oh, six feet. Yeah, I'm six feet. Uh, uh, women uh, tend to shave off about 15 pounds uh, of their actual weight, and then men exaggerate their income by about 20%. Uh, compared to what they, what they actually make. Uh, so in other words, they deceive each other on qualities that are desired by members of the opposite sex. Women desire slightly older men, not, not really old geezers. Uh, they desire qualities like ambition, industriousness, qualities that we know are empirically linked with resource acquisition, uh, at least in the Western world. Women don't like slackers, guys with no goals, guys with no drive, guys who... Uh, whose favorite pastime is uh, sitting with a six-pack of Budweiser on their stomach while they watch a football game or play video games all day. A little bit of football is fine, but um, as a full-time occupation, no. Preference for dependability and stability. Um, these are some uh, prototypes of that, and uh, women want that in a long-term mate. It's very good, okay, having undependable, unreliable, emotionally volatile mates, very bad. Um, and these things, by the way, are linked with having disastrous marriages as well. So I have a recipe for who to avoid mating with, you know, unless you want a very exciting but very rocky and ultimately disastrous and painful marriage. Um, athletic prowess is another thing, offers a cue to protection. Love and commitment uh, is very important. I mentioned uh, one study. Women also want a guy who's willing to commit, uh, uh, willing to invest in children. And so I'll mention one very briefly, how are we doing on time? We do, I should, okay, so I should very, very quickly, I'll mention this. So this is a doctoral dissertation done at UC Santa Barbara by a woman named Peggy Lacera. And she photographed the same men and the same women in four conditions. Okay, one, they're interacting positively with a baby. Condition two, they're ignoring a baby who's in obvious distress. Condition three, they're vacuuming the living room rug. Condition four, they're standing there doing nothing, staring blankly at the camera. Okay. <laughs> and they presented these photographs to women and said, just who do you find most attractive? Okay. Who do you think women found the most attractive? The guy who's interacting positively with the baby. They just melted when they saw that. Uh, <laughs> hated the guy, did not find the guy attractive, he ignored the baby in distress. What about the other two conditions? Vacuum cleaner versus standing alone? Well, vacuum cleaner, of course, because we want a man to help with the household chores. No. They found the guy standing alone more attractive than the guy pushing a vacuum cleaner. Uh, why? Uh, that's open to interpretation and we don't know. Perhaps um, cue to submissiveness or perhaps if he's vacuuming the floor, he's you know, not out doing other things like working. Uh, 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 we don't know. Now, the other interesting thing is in the males, evaluating the females in these four conditions, males basically flatline. <laughs> Context was irrelevant. Holding a baby, ignoring a baby, vacuuming, standing on her head, didn't matter. Men were just focused in on the psychophysical cues to the female, regardless of context. Okay. Uh, now, there's a, what I call the hidden side of female sexuality. This is the last topic that I'll mention here. Um, and that's that we have a puzzle. So um, the, uh, the, the, the puzzle is that, um, that you know, what early on I showed that men do desire uh, more sex partners than women. And, th and that's a fact. It's, it's, it's very well documented across cultures. And it's just simply a sex difference. Desire for sexual variety it shows up in a million different ways in a million different studies using many, many different methodologies. But there's a problem, and that is that it takes two to tango. 
Mathematically, assuming an equal sex ratio in the population, in the mating pool, the number of short-term matings has to be identical for the sexes. And that is, every time a man has sex with a woman that he's never had sex with, a woman is simultaneously having sex with a man that she has never had sex with. Now, of course, the distributions don't have to look identical, but the means have to look identical, assuming an equal sex ratio. So why do women do it? Well, we know why men do it, so at least evolutionarily, the rationale is, is fairly strong there. That is, ancestrally, those men who did gain sexual access to more fertile women would have produced more offspring. But women, even if they have sex with 10 or, or, or 50 or 100 men in the course of one year, they are still limited in their reproduction by that heavy male, that heavy female parental investment. That is, they can't alter that obligatory nine-month investment. And so that means that adding additional sex partners really doesn't benefit them directly. But women do engage in short-term mating of a variety of sorts. One is, one is called EPC mating, as I mentioned. Why do they do it? Well, there are different hypotheses. So one is maybe her current mate is infertile. Maybe she can gain access to additional resources, which might be very beneficial in evolutionary <coughs> bottlenecks, such as ice ages or droughts or times winters when food was not very abundant. Um, access to superior genes, that is genes that were better than her current mate, or perhaps mate switching. She can, she can use a short-term mating as a means of uh, extracting herself from her existing relationship and propelling herself either to an alternative relationship that's better or to, al to transition to the mating market um, with higher self-esteem. So these are hypotheses and there have been a number of tests of these hypotheses. Uh, some sexual infidelity tactics which we're studying now, so I can't give you the results, but she told her partner she's going to attend a lecture on human mating strategies is, is one that we found in our study. Uh, so if, if there are any women that you thought were going to be here that aren't, you might want to ask them where they were. Um, women's uh, sexual desire is a function of ovulation. Uh, very interesting. I'm going to have to skip all that. Some important things happen at ovulation. So even though ovulation is relatively concealed, it turns out that among non-pill-taking women, that is women not on oral contraceptives, there is this very predictable increase in sexual desire um, sex drive uh, around the time of ovulation. Now, I want to ask the women in the audience, which guy you find the most attractive? Okay. So, just raise your hand. Okay, how about this guy on the right? Just raise your hand if you find him the most attractive. How many people find this guy the most attractive? Okay, how about the next guy? Raise your hand. Okay, we get a few takers. How about the middle guy? Who do you find most attractive? Okay, we get more takers. How about this guy? Okay, we get even more takers. How about this guy on the left? Some. Okay, so there are individual differences. Well, it turns out that it depends on whether you're ovulating or not. Um, this, is, this is one of the complexities of women's mating strategies and why men can't understand them. Because not only are there a lot of them, they're all, they also vary as a function of holding a baby, not holding a baby, whether she's ovulating or not. Uh, many, many contexts affect which men women find attractive. And it turns out that when they're ovulating, that is when they're most likely to become uh, uh, pregnant, they're, they're most uh, fertile, uh, they prefer more masculine men. Okay? And this occurs not just for facial features. These are, these are computer morphed uh, images with, that vary on m masculinity, femininity. Uh, that, uh, but also a body, masculine body, so the classic V-shaped torso, a high shoulder to hip ratio, and also vocal masculinity. So a deeper, I can't do it because I'm not James Earl Jones who had a, this great deep resonant voice, but women find the, the deep resonant voices more attractive when they're ovulating than when they're not ovulating. Okay, why is this the case? There are actually three different theories about why it's the case. Um, one has to do with uh, that, it's a, that it's perhaps a health cue. Uh, and, and I can get into the logic of that perhaps in the Q&A because we're running out of time here. But um, uh, so the, the explanation for this is under contention and, and we should know the answer to it within the next couple of years. But the finding is a very robust finding. There's, uh, two, there's a meta-analysis now in press that shows it's very robust across studies. 
uh, so in sum, the, mo the hypotheses, I haven't gone into all these other studies on mate switching and resource acquisition, but they too, there are studies that support these functions. And so these are the most viable contenders. And of course, they, they all could be correct for different women in different circumstances. So now, of course, men don't always know what women want, and they still don't know, despite our scientific progress. Uh, and so there's a lot more research to do on this topic. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and I should say that uh, I did bring in all, all their books for sale outside. I brought in three free copies of books that I'm going to give out to the people who ask the three best questions. So, yes. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, what about love at first sight? How do you explain love at first sight? Is that a real phenomenon or, uh, uh, or what? And, and the short answer is, uh, yes, it is a real phenomenon. It, it does occur, but there's a sex difference. And it's a very interesting sex difference, and that is that men are more likely to ha experience love at first sight than women are. And that is, man is more likely to see a woman at a party, even if he's never even talked to her, and he says, I'm going to marry that woman. Okay. Now, a likely explanation is that one of the things that men value is physical appearance, and physical appearance is one of those things that is more readily available uh, than qualities such as dependability or ambition or other qualities that require a longer time period to assess. So love at first sight, yes, it does happen, but it happens more frequently for men than women. Next question? Yes. Do you want to call on the questions or should I? Uh, okay. Yes, please. Like you mentioned how like cultures that have like food shortages, like the more they uh, desire like plus women more thoroughly. What about like in cultures where they desire like slim women? Do you think like practices of media and stuff that that's endorsed in our culture? That's why they endorse. Yeah, yes, I think w in our, our culture, we don't know for sure because one of the things with cultural change is that, s is that so many things change at the same time that it's almost impossible or very difficult anyway to disentangle what's causing what. But I think that what's happening in our culture is we have this kind of runaway female-female competition. So there are studies where if you ask men, so you present uh, subjects w or participants with images of women that vary in how slim or plump they are, and you ask women, what's your ideal for you? And women point to a, a, a thinner than average ideal. And then they ask women, what do you think men's ideal is? And they point to that same thinner than average. But then if you ask men, what is your ideal? Men say, actually, in the middle of the distribution. That is, men say they like average, not the thin. So it looks like there's a a misperception on the part of women about what men actually desire and it, it, there's at least some evidence, some from my lab, some from other labs, that, that this competition for thinness is kind of a, a almost a, probably a maladaptive runaway female-female intersexual competition aspect. But it's, it's, it seems to be um, it's interesting that there's this misperception. It's one of the uh, one of the few cases where men, uh, where women misread men's minds. There are lots of cases where men misread women's minds, like the sexual overperception bias. She smiled at me. Boy, she smiled at me. That means she wants to have sex with me. I know. That, um, it's called the sexual overperception bias. But this is one area where women have a misperception of what men want. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting question, and I'm going to have to give a view. Sorry? Yes, the question is, what about homosexuality, and what about their mating strategies, and how does that play into this whole mix? Um, you asked several different questions, and I'm going to have to give a very brief answer, but it will probably not surprise you that 
um, it's a question that I frequently get. Um, so I brought in a couple slides. <laughs> uh, uh, there are, you have to break down the question into different components. So one question is, what are the origins of it? One, actually, one question is, is, well, what do you mean by homosexual? Uh, and do you mean homo homosexual orientation or do you mean homosexual behavior? Uh, and those are different things. Okay, so who is the, what, which sex do you most desire or that you're sexually attracted to versus homosexual behavior? Because we know that um, individuals, a higher percentage of individuals engage in homosexual behavior e as either experimentation uh, or when they're like in prison populations when there's an absence of heterosexual outlets and so forth. So, so we have to separate that question. So there's the issue of origins of, um, in this case, homosexual orientation. There's mate preferences of homosexuals compared to heterosexuals. And there's mating strategies. What about uh, lesbians versus male homosexuals? And there's been a fairly a large body of research conducted on this, some from my lab, but a lot from other labs such as uh, Paul Vassi, uh, Richard Lippa, uh, and others. And there are some interesting, uh, the, the short answer on origins is we don't know. Okay, there have been different hypotheses about why. So one is the kin selection hypothesis uh, that hypothesizes that males uh, forego direct reproduction by, in order to invest in genetic relatives, such as their brothers and sisters' children, that is, the person's nieces or nephews. Uh, and that hypothesis was first advanced by E.O. Wilson. There have been empirical tests of it, and there's absolutely no support for it. So, uh, so we can probably rule out the kin selection hypothesis of it. Um, there are other things. Uh, the, the, the most compelling hypothesis for which there is evidence, and let me see if I had a slide for it. Uh, yeah, uh, the most compelling, so that's the kin selection. There's a byproduct of some unknown modern conditions. So we know we live in very weird times. Our diet is very different. There's evidence that, that uh, plastic contains substances that create different hormonal uh, balances in the system. And so there might be some uh, issues there. But, but there's a very interesting theory known as uh, uh, sexually antagonistic gene selection. And, and I don't have time to go into that in detail, but basically what that means is that a gene can have an effect that is different when it inhabits a male body compared to when it inhabits a female body. Uh, and so in principle, a gene could have an effect when it inhabits a male body that is causing male homosexuality, which we know redu reduces reproductive output. But when that same gene occurs in a female body, uh, there's an increase in reproductive output. And so people have looked at the reproductive output of the genetic relatives of male homosexuals. There are a couple studies that find that it in fact is higher. Uh, so there's some evidence for this, but the fact is that the heritability of homosexuality, it turns out to be much lower than originally thought. Early studies came in around a heritability of uh, 50%. More recent studies are coming in at about 20 or 30%. And so it's likely to be, um, the origins of are likely to be a combination of a bunch of different things rather than one big thing. If there was one single thing that caused homosexual orientation, we would know it by now and it would be on the front page of the New York Times if someone discovered it. And so we often find this in psychology that as some phenomena, or there are multiple, multiple causes of it and, um, and, and, and not one single big cause. There is, um, uh, but we do know a fair amount about some of these other questions, mate preferences and mating strategies. So male homosexual mate preferences look very, very similar to heterosexual mate preferences. Homosexual males place a great priority on physical appearance, great priority on relative youth of the partner, uh, and uh, one way to think about it is that homosexuality is sexuality that can be expressed in a way that the person doesn't have to make compromises with the mating strategies of the opposite sex. And so when you see that, um, what you find is that male homosexuals do enact their short-term mating strategies on average to a much larger degree um, than uh, heterosexual males who, who are constrained um, by compromises with the opposite sex. 
Now, with lesbians, uh, they don't place more value on resources and economic resources and so forth, but it is the case that, uh, that female homosexuals or lesbians are more likely to form long-term committed relationships um, and uh, males uh, less so. So anyway, there's a lot more in my book, The Evolution of Desire, I have, a, I have a whole section that summarizes all the empirical evidence that we now know um, about homosexuality. That's uh, The Evolution of Desire. Uh, not yet. So I want to get a few more before... Only have time for a couple more. Okay, let's get... We've had all exclusively males here. Let's, let's get you. And then maybe a couple from the back here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that as far as whether that's true for men and women? Yes, uh, uh, research citing average, mathematically average faces is the most attractive. Actually, the original research that comes from uh, our psych department, uh, Professor Judith Langlois, who was the originator of that research, and she first published on it in 1990. Uh, and yes, it's a very robust effect. Uh, it turns out that what she does is she uses uh, computer morphing technology to statistically average two faces, four faces, eight, 16, 32, and she finds that the, these composite images, people judge them to be more attractive than any of the single individuals that go into that. There are a couple of different hypotheses about why that's the case. One is that but the averaging process uh, 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 eliminates, creates a more symmetrical image. So it eliminates um, asymmetries, and we know that asymmetries are judged typically to be less attractive. So it's, it's one of those evolutionary mating tactics, you know, you know, feeling asymmetrical. See, if I wanted to be a businessman, I could sell this product, right? Okay. Feeling asymmetrical today? I have something that can affect you. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's a bad idea. Uh, so, but yes, there's, uh, there's good research on that effect. The explanation for it is still under some contention. So another question. Yes. Yes, yeah, so it's a good question. It's a question about methodology. You know, is there a difference between what people say or, you know, or do people give you, say, just socially desirable responses or, uh, you know, or versus what they really do? Uh, and, and, it's, and it's an excellent question. And yes, uh, that's why what we do in psychology and in other fields is we look for converging evidence across methods that don't share the same methodological difficulties. And that's why, for example, I presented not just self-reported desire of number of partners, but also behavioral studies that looked at, well, do people actually say, oh, yes, I will have sex with you. Now, I don't know. In that study, one of the interesting things about that study is I was curious about, well, what did they tell people after they said, oh, just, excuse me, this is just a study. Uh, uh, and in the study... In the report, I was looking for what did they tell the subjects after this? All they said is subjects were debriefed. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, what, one more question. Yes. Yes, uh, so that's that's a good question. That's a really good that that deserves that you get one of the books, right there. Okay, uh, because that's something that baffles me. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know what accounts for the the rise of the metrosexual male? Uh, you stumped me there. I I, I really don't know. Um, I could speculate, uh, but I don't even think I should speculate. Does anyone have any uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, do you have some thought on that or a question? Uh, a question. Okay. Uh, do you have uh. any findings or an insight uh, regarding the contrast of uh, between physical appearance and uh, I don't know eloquency of speech in terms of a woman looking for a mate uh, for a mate? So, so uh, are you asking is uh, the contrast yeah between what is the physical appearance uh, the way someone looks and the just the eloquence of someone. Okay, so are these positive, are, are physical appearance and, and verbal eloquence positively correlated? 
Is that is that what you're asking? Or are they or are they negatively correlated? So so the good looking people are can't can't stumble out three words, you know. Um, so there was actually a cartoon about that. There was a guy, a very handsome man, that said, "It's it's a myth, M I T H, that all good-looking guys are stupid, misspelling stupid." Um, but actually, there is a positive correlation in the matrix of desired qualities. So it's a low positive correlation, but it's a positive correlation. So in other words, uh, and this it's an unfair world. Those who are physically attractive also tend to be slightly more intelligent, also tend to be more socially skilled, also tend to have other sorts of positively valued attributes. And so it's one of these, you, you, in an ideal world, you might think, well, well, this person is good looking, but they're really dumb. Or this person has good athletic ability. But it turns out these things are they're positively correlated. And there's, a, there's actually a reason for that, having to do with a phenomenon known as assortative mating or cross-character assortative mating, where even if things start out initially uncorrelated, if you um, let um, characteristics that have some heritable basis, uh, uh, I'm not explaining this correctly, but um, characteristics that are initially uncorrelated can become correlated over time through this process of assortative mating, where the eights mate with the eights, the sixes mate with the sixes, and the fours mate with the fours. Um, but what gets you to be an eight can be a bunch of different things. Okay, uh, so mm, I explained that much better in one of my papers. So apologize for that uh, that poor response, but that's also an excellent question. So I'll give you one. So uh, last 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 question for Dr. Last question. We have one more book, so this, so this better be okay. You've already asked one, so I want to get one from the back of the room here or back here. Okay, how about you? Um, what is your opinion on the influence of pornography on sexual desire and the way that pornography influences sexuality in the modern age? What is, what is my uh, thought on the influence of pornography on sexuality in the modern age? Um, uh, all I can do is speculate about that. I haven't done any research on pornography. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let that one <laughs> lie. Uh, uh, but there, there is evidence that, um, that it distorts people's perceptions of sexuality. That is, people think, oh, this is the way sex lives should be. And, uh, and in studies of people who are in the porn industry, uh, they say, no, this is not at all even how our sex lives are. This is what's in the pornography. So my, my hunch, and this is just a hunch, but based on uh, the little bit of empirical evidence we have, is that it distorts pe what people think sexuality should be all about. <laughs>